Thank you, Cathy. It's always uplifting to come here and to watch this presentation that we have. And it really, it's a very sentimental thing. It, it's quite an emotional uh, experience, especially to attend some of these dinners, as I've done on a number of occasions, especially when we have so many problems outside Australia. We have some in Australia too, but uh, this community, Affinity, is doing a wonderful job in developing a sense of unity among the community. And for that, I'm very honoured to be a member of their advisory board. <clears throat> and thank you, Cathy, for your introduction. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, if I may, today's sponsors, because we've just had a wonderful lunch and there must be people who pay for it. Uh, Mr Mehmet Saral as Saral Com, and also Dr Naeem Win as Win of the Win Medical Services Proprietary Limited. Thank you very much for your contribution and for your support and encouragement of Affinity. Now, it's a privilege to facilitate today's exciting lecture. Exciting? Yeah, let's wait and see. I, I don't know my uh, co-speaker yet, but I'm going to hear what he has to say with a great deal of interest, and then we're going to sit down here and talk about it, and then we're going to have questions, so that's going to be good. Do Dr Alawat has broad experience. He comes from Haryana in India, a state I visited when I was uh, cutting my baby teeth as a student at Adelaide University. Broad experience of working with government agencies and academic institutions. He has worked as an honorary associate with Macquarie University, where I think you are now. And um, his visiting fellow has been visiting fellow University of New South Wales and centre associate and centre an associate with University of Pittsburgh, USA. He doesn't have an American accent, but never mind. In addition, he has worked in collaboration with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and International Organisation for Migration. Dr Alawat has over 20 years of experience in conducting research on topics related to strategic and security issues, and he has worked on Latin American countries, in and on Latin American countries, uh, United States, African region, Asian countries and Australian affairs. You sound like you've probably replicated pretty much what I've been doing. Yeah. Uh, he's published four books, so have I. I shouldn't say that, but... And more than 25 research... I'm introducing him, not him, me. 25 research papers in journals, edited books and think tank publications. In addition to his research and publications, he has wide experience of research guidance that include PhD and postgraduate research projects supervision. Congratulations. That's one of the toughest things. I think you have to do. So please join me in give, giving Dr. Dalbir Alawat a warm welcome. Thank you, Ambassador Richard Bronski, for a liberal introduction. And my cousins and my cousins and uncles also here in Polite's language. <laughs> So let's start on today's lecture. It is quite sensitive also in some sense. Excuse me for my slip of the tongue, but let's move forward on this one. The, how I look at the world, the world is passing through a flux. Why I use the term flux? Because we have moved from the two power system to unipower system to multi-power system. And in that multi-power system, the power, big powers are vying for more power. Somewhere there are, there are convergences, also there are divergences. Convergences are better, but divergences are slightly difficult to look at. If you look at this picture, this was not long back, beginning of this month, first week of this month where a guided missile cruiser, USS Chancellorville, was about to collide with Russian destroyer Admiral Vinogradov. How much a gap was between the two? Just less than 50 meters. And that is not a gap in the waters. So emergency, emergency issues came up, and this was avoided. But in case accidentally it should have not have been avoided. 
there should have been a collision between the US and the Russian warships. This is not unique. Look at these two ships. This was in September, October last year. Again, Chinese Luang destroyer came about to collision with the USS Dector. Less than 45 yards. And that was a terrible situation. This has not happened once with China. This is not accidental. This has happened at least twice. That has come into our public domain. There may be more instances. So what does these two pictures reflect? reflect? There are three actors, China, Russia, and United States. And out of these three actors, United States appears, China versus United States, Russia versus United States. It means the United States is being challenged in the Indo-Pacific region. Challenged by whom? By China and Russia. So in that, in that case, what, what, what's going to happen? This is an open challenge. You can, it, it is not a hidden or some diplomatic voice is being used here. This is a hard reality picture. So why this is happening? And what can happen in the future? These are the two important questions. Let me take you back to understand the present and the future. As you are aware, that the Second World War came to an end with a disaster. Disaster in the sense that two bombs were used on Jap Japanese soil. But after that, there came the peace. And that peace remained the, for a longer, very long time. Because the United, the United States became a guarantor of peace in the Asia Pacific regions. Being a guarantor of peace guaranteed these countries in the Asia Pacific that there are as such no imminent security issues. And these countries had all the energy for their development, use their resources for positive development. And China is, was in the limelight, who benefited maximum from this guarantee of peace. In 1978, it brought economic reforms, aligned itself with the other, other countries, and in a sense developed interdependency with the Western world, mainly United States. And China's test of development was when Asian economic financial crisis came in 97, 98. China came to the rescue and took, pulled out these countries from the financial crisis. And that was the confidence building measure by China, that China is a power that can help Asian countries, its region. But some doubts were castigated the way China operated. And that was elevated by China, that its rise is peaceful and for development. OK, that's fine. Then comes a strategic challenge. 9-11 takes place in the United States. And the United States diverts, diverts its energy in Afghanistan and Iraq wars. And there was a there and created a power vacuum. China was quick to fill this vacuum as though it was waiting for it. But China did more than filling the vacuum. It started building the military military overtures, putting military overtures in the region. It started claiming the disputed territories. And that alarmed the United States and other regional countries. That what are the intentions of China? That it wants a pe development, peaceful development. But why military built up in peaceful development? And here we can see there were further signals. China's budget, rise in defense budget. And these are, this is, graph is from Chinese sources. If you look at from Western perspective, this will go further steep high. Why this budget is increasing year after year? If there is a peaceful rise, economic development, that puts a question mark and also puts a jittery in the neighboring countries. Will China dominate us? 
Will China bully us? Will we lose our sovereignty because China is putting claims in the South China Sea? Furthermore, China put a nine dash line. And this red line in the South China Sea, China claims that this is Chinese territory, this, there is Chinese sovereignty. Whereas that is being contested by Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. So regional countries are, became apprehensive of rising Chinese power. How to deal with, the, with China? Furthermore, China developed the red lines also, anti-excess, anti-area denials. These are the red lines for outside countries. And China will be behaving differently if these countries increase their military presence in these island chains. So what does this indicate? If the Chinese rise was, was for peaceful development, there is more than peaceful development. There is military built up. Then what, what it needs from the neighbors? It needs some balancing, maintaining a balance of power. How to maintain that balance of power that was existing during the Cold War, before disintegration of the Soviet Union? So here I will take three actors, United States, China, and India. You will say that Japan, Australia, South Korea also matter. I consider them as alliance partners of the United States. If United States takes a policy decisions, I think this alliance partner will go with the United States. So nowadays, in this strategic balancing, China has its own ambition. What is that ambition? It wants a unipolar Asia. That in the Asia, China should have a predominant role like the United States has in Latin American region, if it has to become a superpower. But multipolar world, the world should not be dominated by only by United States, but by the multi-powers. There can, then comes the United States. That wants to retain a status quo, that um, there should be a multipolar Asia and a unipolar world dominated by United States. India. India is a new entrant in the, in the field, uh, sports a multipolar Asia and a multipolar world. So these are the three major countries in the Indo-Pacific region, because previous, previously it was Pacific region and Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. Now this co-joined co -joined oceans are mainly reflect India's increasing role as a strategic or economic power. So for a unipolar Asia, China's first stand is one China. That is, Taiwan is part of China, one country, two systems, and it cannot be contested. Those are the red lines. Then it claims 80% of South China Sea. It has starting, it has dressed and filled the Spr Spratly and Paracel Islands, and come to a, the point that this is a natural right as a sovereign country. In 2015, President Xi Jinping assured that for these islands are for economical development, then there will be no military, military built-ups. But that has been revisited, and there are military built-ups. I mean, during the ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, developing a code of conduct China insisted the regional countries that the external power should not be part of this. And who are these external pow pow powers? I think that's well understood, the United States. So in a se sense, China wants the United States out of this strategic region. And for a multipolar world, China has initiated a Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road starting from China, passing through Asia, through to Africa, and reaching to Europe. It means United States is out in the Chinese framework. And to protect this infrastructure, China may deploy its PLA, People's Liberation Army. China's major, major point of, is that US, US version of democracies has failed in 90% 90, 90 of the countries. So that is not the viable solution. Perhaps China, Chinese version can be a better one. 
And there comes the parallel institutions that if China is not getting its due share in the international, international institutions, it has come out with the parallels, such as AIIB, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where the Asian and Eurasian countries are members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And Russia is being involved, an inclusive approach taken, adopted towards Russia to play an active role in this region. So that is the way it wants a multipolar world. Then comes with the United States. United States has come with the Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific construct, geostrategic construct, so that more countries are involved and Asia is no more dominated by, the, by a single country. I mean, in Taiwan, American Institute works very heavily. Some critics even go to the extent of saying that is what in a arbitrarily, that is the US embassy in Taiwan. Donald Trump has taking, taking North Korean leader out of the Chinese influence has had direct summits that we need not to interact through China. We should have direct links with, with North Korean leadership. Again, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan policies that US is pursuing that is in contravention to the Chinese interest. I mean, during the RIMPAC naval exercises, China was disinvited and India was invited. So that was a big, big issue that Asia is not, not China. Asia has its own identity and US is there to support them. Then comes the multipolar world. There is, look at the trait. China tops United States and put all countries together. China is heavier on that one. So Donald Trump came with the tariffs on the Chinese imports and United States have oh, around 800 naval bases throughout the world where China has only one in Djibouti. Second, you can say in the future will be in the Gawadar in Pakistan. So you, from Pacific Command, now US has turned into US Indo-Pacific Command. And there are new roles have been come up. The BRI Belt and Road Initiative by China is projected, is projected as predatory and India is being influenced and India is becoming more a stronger partner with the United States. Then comes India. India and China have had good relations. They fought a war in 1962. Since then, the relations are, you can say, working relations. But India found itself encircled by China. If you look at these stars, these are built by China. And on the top, China, India have the disputed border of 4,000 kilometers. On the other side, India and India and Pakistan have the disputed borders. I mean, China has built on the, that red line, if you can see. China has built a road and railways there. So India found itself uncircled. This means India, if India is, can be a challenger to China, but contain India at the very earliest. So for that, this is known as string of pulse, these ports around India. So India has boycotted the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And I want face China when its, its forces came to build roads along the border. Indian forces entered in, Pac in China. And, and India and China had face of for around two months. Then joining the G Limoa logistic agreement with the United States, building its tripartite command on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and joining the, joining the US partnership that US role is critical in the Indo-Pacific region, where China wants to oust United States from this region, and ultimately turned into a quadrilateral meeting. Means the democracies of the region, such as Japan, Australia, United States, and India, they should come together for a rules-based order. Then India does not agree with the, all the way agree with the United States and it supports multipolar world. Their Chinese and Indian interests converge. And that way, because United States is a global player, its strategic priorities shift as per changes in the strategic requirements of the country. 
Also, India and Russia have had very historic relations, such as during the lunchtime, they were saying S-48 to Turkey. S-48 is signed by India also with Russia, the advanced level missile system. So United States put pressure on India, but India demonstrated that it will retain the strategic autonomy. It will make its own decisions. And bilateral trade with China is increasing. It has reached up to $73 billion over a period of time. And some of the institutions initiated by the China, such as BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. India is a member of that. Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India is also part of that. So India that way wants to maintain a strategic autonomy. So these pow three powers, they, where they, China and US are totally in contravention of each other, India goes halfway with China, halfway with the United States. And finally, there are flashpoints that are emerging in this region, such as Xi Jinping in, on 26th October 2018, while addressing its forces, PLA forces, asserted that China should prepare for war. As I said, Chinese ships have come within 45 yards of the U US destroyer. India and China faced each other in Doklam, face to face with both the militaries. If some incident should have taken place, there may have been escalation of war. And also, retired US Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, he's a highly respected journal there, has expressed, has expressed that there may be a war in the next 15 years with China. Likelihood of a war with China. So I will, these are the flesh points. Trade is increasing, but also geostrategic and security issues are coming towards a more boiling side. A more, they are simmering at the moment. So there is criticality in the Indo-Pacific region. And this criticality is being, is, being taking, is being taking place in the absence of some mature power. Neither the United Nations is strong enough to deter these powers, nor there are other big powers that they can come in between. So all these big powers are playing the games. But these games are moving from heading towards sort of incidents or accidents that we saw in number of cases. If that be so, what will be the future? That is a critical question. We don't have answer for that. I will stop here. Thank you very much.